Do you remember the big waves that are about to drown the cities all over the world at the end of the movie, The Abyss? No, because I've never seen Abyss. <laughs> I haven't seen it either. <laughs> I haven't seen the, the Abyss. I was thinking of, oh, I could do a cool intro. And of course, like none of you guys have seen the movie. Hello and welcome to another episode of Cut to Reveal, the podcast where we talk about editing and cinema and anything in between. So I am Ricky and I'm with Peter and Erwan. And today we're going to be talking about director's cut. Erwan has come up with this topic, so I'll let him take it from there. Okay, so I'm going to find another example. I'm going to be pissed off if you haven't seen that one. Do you guys remember in E.T., the walkie-talkies that the FBI agent have. I know what you're talking about, yes. So that's the version you saw? No, I saw the original version. So do you know what's the difference between that version that I was talking about and the original version? The original version, they were carrying guns. They weren't carrying walkie-talkies. Really? And so why change it? I think it's it, they changed it because of the times. They're like, oh, that's too violent for this kind of kids type movie or whatever, or the studios or something along those lines. What actually happened is that there was a scheduled re-release for E.T. by Steven Spielberg. And he decided, since it was post 90 11, he wanted to have less violence in the movie. That's right. And so the FBI agent who had guns and shotguns, he like asked to remove them. There's also a line in the movie where one of the mothers is calling his kid a terrorist. And they changed that because the word terrorist was now very loaded. Also, there was the special effects that were changed to look better. And so that's how we got that director's cut 30 years later. I wanted to talk about that kind of stuff, changing an original cut for a director's cut or a, a longer cut, because that's something that we're now used to. I mean, like one of the biggest examples that we got a year or so earlier was the um, Justice League movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. The Schneider cut. Zack Snyder managed to finish his cut of the movie and released it. And he was kind of different from the version of Joss Whedon. So what's your experience, Piotr, with uh, the director's cuts? Like, at least, like, different cuts of a movie. I haven't seen many director's cuts. Maybe I've seen more than I know of. <laughs> Possible. But, you know, the, the ones that, like, I, I watched, like, deliberately for director's cuts are The Lord of the Rings. Each one is, like, one hour longer than the version that was distributed in the theaters. With that specific example of Lord of the Rings, if you're someone who likes that world, it's the only version you want to watch from now on. But is it a better movie? Like, because the whole thing about director's cuts or logo cuts and about Peter Jackson, he said at the time that the theatrical version was the cut he wanted to make. The longer cuts are for like people who really enjoy that well, as you were saying. Yeah, it's not like with the Snyder's cut where, where the version that was distributed in the theaters was not approved kind of, right, by, by, by Snyder. Uh, so it's a different story. I, I get it. Like that both ver versions are kind of director's cuts in this case. Only that one is like, you know, for like a narrower fan base. But actually, like, let me go back to that question of which one is better, if I may. Even based on the experience I have right now, I'm re-editing a feature film, actually. I started working on it like a month ago. When the film got to me, it was already uh, edited by two people. And there were a lot of things about the film that I thought should be different, that we should change. Like remove a few scenes and change the order of the scenes and so on, right? And I brought the idea to the director. Initially, he didn't like a lot of those ideas, right? We ended up making a lot of the changes I suggested, but there are things that like the director felt very strongly about that stayed in that version that we have right now, which is very close to the picture lock. With the version that we almost ended up with, it's hard to say whether or not including all of the changes are suggested at the very beginning would make the film better. Because I think like my thinking when I started working on it was how do I make it good for majority of the audience. But the thing is that like it doesn't make the film better if it's better for a majority of the audience. Like sometimes a better film will be the one that it will be very good for minority of the audience. So I think the director is the one who has the vision and that's their responsibility to like keep on track with their vision. Your role is to kind of like help you achieve the greatest potential, but at the same time step away if it does changes that vision too much. It sounds like the director's cut is essentially subjective. I guess it depends on if the director actually says like, this is my director's cut, this is my version. 
like especially with your example about Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson was like the theatrical version are the ones that I like. And then the extended versions are for the people who want to see more of that world. That being said, then that means the theatrical version is actually the director's cut. It used to be the same for Blu-ray and DVD releases. It was an incentive for you to buy the movie because if it's a movie that you enjoyed in theater, there's going to be extra stuff. And sometimes the studio even didn't ask for the director to come in and cut the movie. They just put back some stuff. So it was for extra sales. But it's not going to be the same for like director re-releasing a movie after recutting it because he felt like the movie that was released first wasn't the movie he wanted to show and he felt was a better movie before. Right. Like Blade Runner is a good example of that. Yeah, exactly. There's two different kinds of director's cut. There's the one that's for sales and there's the one that the director really want to recut and re-release his movie because he feels like the big audience hasn't seen yet the movie he wanted to show. I have a few examples of that, but the biggest one is of course Blade Runner. Do you know how many cuts of Blade Runner were shown throughout the history of the movie? No idea. I think it's over seven. There's actually like eight cuts that were shown to some kind of audience, but like most people had access to four of them because that, they weren't the ones that were released to the public because there was some like work print that was shown in, in some theaters. But like the big ones we had was the original cut. There was the director's cut and there was like uh, one of them, I don't know the name, but the, the last one was the final cut. I was thinking about like in an ideal world, there would only be one version of a movie, one cut. It's the one you have seen in theater or that was released in theater. And I'm always wondering as to why the director feel the need to go back to a movie and change it because they're not the same person as they were like, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. And society has changed and technology has changed. If you ask me, I, I'm really against like going back and changing that because since you're not the same person, it's not going to be the same movie anymore. It's as if like Picasso felt like one of his paintings was, a, there was something he wanted to change. So he went back and changed it. it would be like awful, but that's the same for movies. I don't know that that's, a, that analogy is good because with films, we have the original version that you may have fallen in love with when you were a kid. And then we have another version that other people would see. But I understand what you're saying. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with all your versions, reasons of why directors do what they do in regards to it, because it's all subjective and it's always different. Specifically, what comes to mind is uh, George Lucas in the, um, the Star Wars movies. Like he wanted, he didn't like the way that they looked because he didn't think technology was far enough ahead to basically do the things that he wanted to do. So then 30 years after, for all of his movies, he ended up changing it where he t he made it like better with digital graphics and stuff like that. But it's like, I fell in love with the original three that came out as they were. And then when he was like, I'm going to make these in the way that I want them to be with better graphics, animation stuff. It didn't go in seamlessly and we could tell that it was all, it was not the same. He did it with uh, THX 3000 as well. Like he, there were a bunch of like creatures at the end. He changed all that stuff and you can see it. It's not like seamless. So it just kind of pulls you out of the film, especially when you already know you have uh, the expectation of something and then it looks different. But I don't know, but at the same time, like a lot of these people are working, these directors are working with big studios and so you've got a lot of cooks in the kitchen. So they may have a vision, but then the executives also have a vision and they think that they know the best way to like sell this film. And maybe there's test screenings that people didn't understand or whatever. So it depends on each. Or notes from the test screenings that were misinterpreted. You, you don't like the idea of them changing something that you may have fallen in love with. The thing that bothers me about that and to the very extreme side of it is when you've got somebody remaking something or like they cut it and then you've got people being like, you're totally ruining my childhood. Oh my God, you're ruining everything in my life. I know that's not, I know that's not what you're saying, but that's like the extreme sin where it's just like, oh my God, is, is your life so fragile that they're going to change something in a movie <laughs> that is still around? The, the thing is that if you like the original Blade Runner with, you know, with the, uh, the narration in it, and then you see the final cut, there is still the narration version of Blade Runner that you can still enjoy and own. <laughs> I mean, just, just you saying that the original movie is still there. Actually, it's very, extremely hard for anyone to find the original version of the Star Wars movies. I mean, I have them on VHS, but you could, you, you probably could still find them. But for most people, you couldn't go into a store and find the original cut of these movies. Same thing for Blade Runner. And that goes back to the example I was giving about the paintings. Like most people don't have access to these because they were like wiped out because of the new cuts that came in. Yeah. But as for the original Star Wars, without like these awful dated CGI that he added, you can't find them. You have to go online and you will never find a 4K, a beautiful 4K version of that. It's, not, it's never going to be done because George Lucas like wiped it out completely. And that's really terrible to see a, an author like that take out completely his creation. I was talking about E.T. 
And Spielberg went back and said he shouldn't have done it. It was such a particular time after 9-11 in the US. Yeah. But George Lucas is very much different. Like he, he completely took that out. There's also like the infamous Christmas TV movie, Star Wars. Well, I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, as I was talking last time about French movies and about like La Classe Américaine, like it's still there and the author like recognized that it's still there. Everybody knows it's still there. And George Lucas really tried to, to make it disappear and that's a shame and and that's something that to me the directors are doing when they're recutting their movies that's gonna go against my point about having directors cut and changing the movie because sometimes it's for the best it was for the best for blade runner it was for the best like one of my favorite movies is pat garrett and billy the kid from sam pekinpa and because the film was released like was cut against his wishes and at some point after he died some editors found his notes and they managed to to recut and and release the movie. And nowadays, like it's one of those these recuts that are most the most well known because it's very much different from the original movie that was a studio movie. Mm -hmm. You have this kind of, of movies that are very much different from because of studio interference. Like just on on my list, I got like Kingdom of Heaven, and the director's cut was much longer. Like I think it's thirty to one hour more uh, of footage. And it's very much different from the original movie. And you have movies like Brazil. Aliens also is a is an interesting case because Aliens and Terminator 2, for example, they have like kind of director's cut, like special edition, they called it, mm -hmm. um, on on Blu-ray and, and, and 4K. For example, I remember James Cameron saying that when Terminator 2 was about to get released, he had to make the movie a certain uh, runtime. I think it was two hours, around around two hours. And he had a very hard time. So he had to sacrifice some scene, but he was very happy with the movie in the end. 20 years later, he decided like to put these scenes back in and you can find them on, on these Blu-rays. And what's interesting is that the scenes that were put back in are like seamless in editing. Like it they completely makes sense within the movie, uh, but he still like recognized the original cut as his director's cut. So. What I meant is sometimes you don't even know what's the director's cut. When I'm about to watch a movie that I know have different cuts, I go onto the internet and ask, what cut should I watch? Because I want to watch the best version of the movie. And sometimes it's not the original version. I didn't know there was another version of Aliens or like Superman 2, even Brazil. And I didn't even take into account there's like TV versions. I knew that there was a bunch with Blade Runner. I mean, beyond that, Star Wars is more like they just changed all the graphics and stuff or try to make it more up to date. But with um, the uh, Snyder cut, the story with that is his daughter died. So he was like, I can't be dealing with this. So he basically backed away. The, those circumstances are different. And then it was a campaign led by audiences to like, well, we want to see what the original cut would have been. And I've seen it. It's like four hours long. You've got some scenes in there that are like, okay, we can cut now. <laughs> we can get back to what we were talking about. But there are there. It's, it fills in a lot of gaps to make the that story like more cohesive. For the Justice League, it's even if you don't like the movie, at least like the guy had the chance to express himself. And to show the movie he wanted to he wanted to make and many directors as we say don't have that opportunity and i'm thinking of the movie um like for example ad astra uh, by james gray or the movie dark city in both cases you have voiceover like in dark city it's uh, during the opening and in ad astra it's throughout the movie it's actually something both directors didn't want in their movie in dark city the voiceover narrated by Kiefer sutherland kind of introduces you to the universe and so you're not as confused as the main character who like wakes up in a bathroom and he doesn't know who he is, why he's there. And so you're much more confused. To me, that's really a plus because that was the original intent. And that was very much like the studio wanting, oh, no, people are going to get confused. But that's the idea. I want them to be confused. As we all know, as editors, making movies is a collaboration. And especially like with the producer, between the director and the producer, it's sometimes a tense relationship because we used to hear that, yeah, we want the artists to be able to uh, express themselves and express their vision. And so we often see the producers as, as big bad wolves, like they want to impose their own vision on the movie. So we have to fight them. But, but often that collaboration can be very good also. We're talking about Francis Ford Coppola's. And so on the first Godfather, the producer fought with him a lot. He said, the movie's too short. You have all that great material and you need to put that back in. And so that means that because of the producer, it's better. The movie The Godfather is what it is now. I wanted to say that because we're talking about the director Scott and the studio interference, but also like studio can mean producer and producer often can help the movie be better because sometimes some producers are really good at their job and they really understand the audience and what the director needs 
to make a better movie. If I may, I, I'd like to go back to that uh, analogy you made with the paintings. Y you probably know this quote, I think it's Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, the work of art is never finished, it's only abandoned. And I think this is also like a thought that like stands behind this phenomenon of like, you know, trying, wanting to redo your choices. And in some cases, like, let's say like Parasite, right? I don't think we will ever see like a recut version of Parasite because it's pretty much the way it was scripted. But I imagine that like with a lot of movies, it's a different story. There is a script. There is production that is very complicated because all of the, you know, fundraising and producers involved and stuff like that. And then there is editing that turns out to be rewriting to a much greater extent that anyone would have assumed at the very beginning. So because of that, you have to get to the point where you abandon the work of art. And if there were many compromises, I understand that like throughout the years, years later, the director might feel the urge to fix some things that they didn't have control over, you know, then, but maybe they do now, like with, with George Lucas and Star Wars, right? So, you know, I think it depends. And also, you know, you, you said that you don't like that idea of like, you know, redoing a, a work of art, right? But like, I think what, what is also be different between movies and paintings is that with paintings, as, as long as the artist didn't burn his practice work, then you see all of the stages. Like, you know, there are a lot of painters that like, they repeat the same topic, the same even objects, right? And and paint them over and over again. And we only know this one very famous version of it, but there are like other versions and they exist, right? And, and you know, and like people that are interested in this stuff know about this, right? But with movies, it's different, different because even though we have like 10, 15 versions of a film before we reach to that one that is delivered uh, to the theater, theaters, no one will ever see those 14 versions versions because those are kind of like you know they're even hidden from the view and like you know only a view very few people have access to those things so that that what makes it all to be different as well i agree that as a filmmaker myself we understand that if we have the means to go back if you have the ability to go back you're gonna think about it at least like i'm gonna have time to change that but as you were saying about da vinci like you have to abandon at some point your project Many people compare movies to a, to a baby. It's your baby and after 18 years out of your hands. You can't take your kid and say, oh, you're coming back home now. No, he's living his life. And so then you make another one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, exactly. Like you're making another movie. Some directors, I'm pretty sure, are trying to fix their previous movie through their new movie. Yeah, yeah. They repeat the themes. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, the storytelling issues that they had in the first movie, we're going to try and make it better. And, and so it's very much like a good comparison between, between the two. But you were talking about Star Wars changing minor like CGI effects, and it's not about changing the storytelling of the movie. But still, if it was just CGI, like it doesn't mesh. Like you were saying, like you see that the CGI doesn't go along with the visuals that we have. Like it looks like a film made in the 70s, and you have like that disconnect with CGI from the early 2000s. It's so different that I'm pretty sure that most adults would notice immediately, even the ones not knowing about Star Wars, like even the way it's shot. Yeah, there are good things about like roughness as well, right? The authenticity of like uh, having something like not really highly produced is very often actually something that draws people in, right? Like for example, like even even like if with Polish movies, there is like a series of movies that like are very low production quality, but there are people that love them because of that, because it is like, you know, kind of like work in the garage. Yeah, it looks homemade. And that's something that you, you often want to see because it looks like, oh, these guys just decided to make a movie and it's so different, so fresh in a way. Yeah, and it would be weird if like all of a sudden, like in the of the movie there would be like corrected version of the scene <laughs> with like you know with like uh, Ari Alexa or whatever right the one thing is I hate to be the the devil's advocate here but also we have that knowledge like when audiences first saw Star Wars they were like this is amazing these are the best graphics I've ever seen this story is amazing George Lucas was like this is fine <laughs> you know and so you get people who are fall in love with it and we now knowing the extent of technology, what things can look at, we can look back and be like, there's a charm to these movies that we have fallen in love with. And to see it any other way eliminates that charm and makes it not as good as we remember or as that we like it. So it's kind of like if you have if if you were a kid who had only seen 
the you know as we will say the shitty star wars with the shitty graphics from 2000 in it and you fall in love with that then you're going to be like this is i don't expect it to be any other way this is what i've fallen in love with i'm going to look back at the older ones and i'm going to be like this looks like shit it should have these shitty graphics in it because that's the one i like but you know what i mean it's like it's a yeah it's a perce- perception thing and what you've what you fall in love with at first and the same time it's like we as I don't want to say cinephiles, but we know movies and we go after movies and we look for them and stuff compared to like the general audience who don't have, you know, a bookshelf with a hundred thousand <laughs> videos. I feel targeted. Yeah. We're connoisseurs. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but we're connoisseurs. Like we want to see the best story, the best version of that film rather than like, okay, well I'm going to, you know, we are going to watch every iteration of Blade Runner, but at, there's a certain point where there's like, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to watch every rough cut of this film. I just want to see the final one that maybe this person was like, this is the best story. This is the best version. This is what you should see. You're right. And in the end, I think it depends. I would like to see less of these director's cuts. I would like the cut that is released to be the final cut in a way. In an ideal world, that's what would happen. And I know that a movie like Can Evolve, and I was, and I wanted to mention the fan versions, the fan cuts, because uh, like there was fan cuts for uh, The Hobbit, an actor from the, um, the TV series, That 70s Show. I don't recall his name right now, but he, he actually recut uh, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and made a showing for his, his friends. The Hobbit was way better because it was only one movie. And so we have now, as fans and as cinephiles, we have the opportunity to grab their, these movies and recut them on our own. So I understand, and some people do so, I understand why, like, since it's, it's easier nowadays, why uh, directors would want to do that, do the same, like be able to make the best showing of, the mo- of their movies. We're talking about big directors who have a lot of clout that can go back to their movies and change it. And some of the time, and I will finish on that, we're talking about directors and, and we're thinking, oh, they're going to add stuff because that's what happened most of the time, right? A weird example is the Coen brothers who took the, their first, very first movie, uh, Blood Simple, and cut it shorter because they felt like it felt too long. And so even like these directors, which I, whom I wasn't expecting, recut versions of their movies. I have a version here of Blood Simple, and I don't know which if it's the shorter of if it's the original version. That goes to my point of we don't know. I mean, we're talking about director's cuts here, but specifically with like the Snyder cut, <laughs> the only reason we really have it is because of fans. It brings to mind uh, another film, the original Super Mario Brothers movie with um, Bob Hoskins. It's an insane film, kind of the same thing, like there were expectations and then too many cooks in the kitchen with the studios and the producers and, and whatever, and what the directors originally had. A lot of stuff was cut out, but then a bunch of fans, they found like the actual test footage of it and they recut the film and they added all the stuff that was cut out and they put it all back in. I mean, they just did it like okay, we have a VHS version. We found a a CD version of it. So it's better quality. We're going to throw it in. And so they kind of added it and they lengthened it out. And the film makes sense. It's still totally insane, but it makes more (laughs) sense. And it's like the the quality of picture, depending on the scene and or the additional stuff, like you can tell like, okay, this is test footage because we we can see the time code or this is obviously uh, VHS because there are a bunch of follows on it. But it's like something like that, where sometimes to your point about, well, now fans can take films and recut them into something new that's like more and more realistic now as we're getting you know as the future becomes the present or whatever but it's very interesting to like see that like sometimes there's you'll find cuts that are like these are the fan cuts these are the cuts that like a lot of people have fallen in love with because they're like well the director's cut sucked or what we saw in the theaters isn't as good as it could have been and i'm gonna you know i have access to this stuff so let's let's get together and put it all together uh, if you want to see that film, you can actually watch it online. It's it's so insane. It's it's really funny, but it's like it's com- it's a completely insane movie. To really finish on on that subject, I'm just gonna mention something that is different from a, a director's cut, and it's something that involves AI. James Cameron's True Lies, Abyss, and Terminator 2. These were the picture was digitally changed, so it looks like it was shot on a digital camera. I saw that version of Terminator 2 in theater a, a while ago when it was kind of re-released for the anniversary. And I was like, it looks good. Like you could show that to anyone and most people wouldn't know the difference. But it actually sparked a whole conversation on the internet about like, why do we need to change the look of mov- movies? Like, okay, you don't want it to look like film, but why? You want it to look modern, but it's a movie from the 90s. And I'm very much on the fence about that because I want the pictures to look like when they were released. 
Uh, but I understand that maybe more easily find a new audience with people who are used to like these pictures with great looking image, you know? And so I don't know how you feel about that, guys. If all the movies that you love, like were re-released and like the only version you had access to were like scrubbed film and it was, and it looked like, and it looked like digital movie. Yeah, I think you made a good point with like possibly finding a new audience with remaster ver remastered version. So that's a good point. But at the same time, yeah, I don't like that idea of like, you know, uh, trying to make it something just for the sake of making it more modern. That seems to me like a money grab. But then that 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 begs the question, like, is it better if they re-released it remastered? Or somebody made a re a revisioning of it, like they did a, a we'll remake it so that more, there'll be a new audience. You know, it's got its it's a, it's built in audience, so people are going to come see it anyway. Which is why we get so many Supermans, Batman, Spider Mans, or other versions of whatever. Yeah. I actually think that it's it's not a, a money grab because it's as far as I know, it's only James Cameron. You know, James Cameron is very much into technology. It's very mm -hmm. much he wants to push the envelope on that. And I think that he wanted he wanted his films to look like very modern, and he wanted to use AI on these movies. And and I'm I'm guessing he wanted to see what could be achieved with that because that's always something that he had done in the past. He wanted to push the boundaries on stuff. I think it comes more from James Cameron than anyone else. I could be wrong about that. I mean, he's one of the biggest directors in the world. If he wanted the movies to be released looking like film, he could. So I think he made a push for it to to have AI use it and. And sometimes to the detriment, like there's a lot of people who are not happy with uh, Aliens and True Lies movies getting released on, on 4K and looking sometimes looking not that good because the eye kind of scrub and creates like what was a dimple or something like that on someone's face becomes a vein. So yeah, it's little details, but yeah, it's, it's another thing that we're going to see, I'm guessing, I'm hoping not, but we're going to see more and more in new release. And that may be in 10, 20 years, like the only versions of, of movies we have are going to be AI'd in post-production. Which is funny because many films, even short films that I see, are shot on digital and then people add alerts or something like that to make it look like it was shot on film because they feel like it looks better. But I also think that like after a few years of like, you know, excitement over, you know, AI making things look, look fancier and stuff like that, I think there will be also a social movement of like, I want to see it as rough as it gets because of that nostalgia and, you know, and, and also like even young people, I think not even, not those that remember it, but those that like will stand for that the original creativity that was pre AI era, I think, I think that both of these phenomenons will be, will, will be something we'll, we'll leave among, I think. I mean, that's happened. That happens right now. I mean, it happens with music. Like right now, we're living in a time where the sale, the sale of vinyl records has never been higher, even when vinyl records were like the big thing, you know, like more people want want that analog feel because they want to listen to a record because it sounds much different than something that has been an MP3 on like your iPod or, or whatever. You know, there are people right now that are just shooting stuff on a VHS and like that's their thing, you know, because they like the VHS look. It may not be because they don't have access to a digital whatever, because you could shoot something on your phone. It's just like, well, this is what I want. And people like still shooting on film. Like how many times have you heard like they actually shot this all on film? We want to hear from you, listener. So if you want to give your two cents about what we talked about on this episode, you can reach us at podcast at cut to the point dot com. Leave us a message at speakpipe.com forward slash CTR. Always with the Instagram at cut to reveal our YouTube channel, which is at cut to reveal also. And then um, if you want to leave comments on our uh, Spotify episodes with your phone, <laughs> get into it. So, uh, yeah, so that's it for this week. Hopefully we'll see you again next week or you'll be listening next week. So thanks, everybody. I hope you have a great day. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.